Hi everyone and uh, welcome to this first uh, seminar uh, series, uh, Deliberate. Um, hopefully you all caught the spelling. Um, it's great to have you here joining us today. Um, I'm Kerry Davis, um, I'm the Director of the Centre for Deliberative Research at NatSEN and I'm here with my co-chair Suzanne Hall. Hi everyone, um, my name is Suzanne Hall, as Kerry was saying, I'm Director of Engagement here at the Policy Institute at King's College London. And, and thank you so much for joining us today. This is the place to be rather than reading the Sue Gray report, that's for sure. And it's the first in an ongoing informal seminar series exploring a whole range of aspects to do with the theory and practice of deliberation. And over the course of this seminar series, we really hope to be able to provide you with an informal and also non-judgmental and conversational space for practitioners, for theorists, for policymakers, and really just anyone who's interested in these approaches and ways of working to come together, to listen to experts in their field, talk about their perspectives on and their experiences of deliberation, as well as their reflections on what works and, and what could be better. We want uh, these conversations to be inclusive. We're going to be talking about deliberation in the broadest sense. So not just the role that citizens assemblies can play, though that of course will be a part of it, but how we can use the full range of deliberative approaches to engage meaningfully with the public and policymakers on some of the most pressing social policy issues of our time. We of course will be considering deliberation in the context of democracy, concepts and approaches tied to institutions and intended to influence or create change to policy and with governments, as well as deliberation as a research method used more just to explore questions and challenges that are not always derived from or embedded in kind of actual current live policy questions. In either case, we're going to be exploring a diverse set of topics, including issues related to inclusivity and deliberation, the impact deliberative work can have on policy and participants, how they can be done well online, and how they can be used to help us identify and plan for problems of the future, never mind those we face today. We'll be looking at what's worked well, but also what's next for deliberation. How can we keep things fresh? And we also want to hear from you. We'd love it if you could get in touch with us and let us know what aspects of deliberation you'd like to see debated and we'll do our best to help. So it's a whole range of topics, but whatever it is that we're focusing on, these, conversa these conversations aren't really intended to be a how-to guide. Rather, we hope that what you'll hear today and in future seminars will encourage you to reflect on your own practice, inspire you to try new approaches as well. We'll also hope that they help you develop a bit of a language to talk to clients, to funders, commissioners about the values of these approaches. But more than anything, we really hope to be able to establish a community of practice. We're all here today because we're intrigued by or we're grappling with the potential and the possibility of these that these approaches can bring and surely we can better realize that by working together and sharing what we found along the way so without any further hesitation any more from us let us explain a little bit about how these seminars are going to work in each we'll hear from a range of speakers about their point of view before responding to a series of questions there'll be plenty of time for you two to have your say and please feel free to post questions in the chat box along with your name and organization if you're happy to share that. So today we're delighted to be joined by two inspirational women we both had the pleasure of working with in various roles. Um, and firstly, I'd like to introduce Sarah Castell, who last year was appointed Chief Executive of Involve, the leading public participation charity, and who have been the driving force behind the Scottish Climate Assembly and the, re and the recent Citizens Jury on Assisted Dying in Jersey. Just two incredibly impressive examples from a huge raft of projects that they're involved in. Prior to this, Sarah also had a successful career at commercial research organisations, Ipsos UK and Flamingo. We're also welcoming Miriam, Programme Director at Engage Britain. Um, Miriam is the engine behind their huge and innovative programme of work into social care, which has involved community conversations. I'm sure many of you will have heard of these or seen the work that they're doing there. And her description of the light bulb moment, which made her a passionate advocate for deliberation is such a lovely story. It's maybe one that she'll, she'll share today. And it's certainly a good reminder that if you do what you love, then you don't. it never feels like work. So I did see a version of this on Twitter recently, which said, do what you love and you'll work hard all the time without any separation or boundaries and take everything extremely personally, which definitely meant I felt seen. Both can be true. Um, but on this, we're going to just hand over to our speakers and thank you to both of them for joining today. Um, first to Sarah. Hello, everybody. Thank you so much, Suzanne and, and Kerry. That's the best intro I've had for a long time. So that's fantastic. Thank you. And uh, 
well, what have you done your research going to all the places I've worked, which which is uh, possibly slightly embarrassing going back many years. Um, yes, hello. Uh, I'm going to talk um, about deliberation, I suppose, with a, 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 a so with some reflections really about how it can help us solve big problems. Um, so my my central thesis really, and I don't think it's a, a huge surprise, and it's not it's not rocket science, is that is that deliberation is not a research method. It's a way of doing society. It's, it's a way of doing, being with other people and uh, making decisions in the world. It's a less adversarial, more equitable way of, of solving problems. Um, and I think the, va the value of it, I guess, if you're a social researcher, is that it allows you a way of, in a structured fashion, extracting the essence of the best way people solve problems among themselves and then allowing you to then take a decision forward because you can be confident in the view that the people in your deliberation have come to you can be confident that their view applies to a wider a wider society um, and so to me that's the heart of it and that's what excites me about about doing deliberation and and advocating for it in lots of different spaces um, and and with that kind of overview of it it can be slotted into everything from the whole ecosystem of the way we govern the way that we think about research and knowledge production in sub science and technology for example um, in the way that we make decisions about our communities in the way that we hear all the different voices that we need to in order to make sure that things things work well so so that's my kind of start start point really so uh, as, as Suzanne and Kerry said at the beginning I'm I'm not going to be talking about you know how to do it or how many people should you have in a group or you know what what kind of materials are used or what how do you know if an expert's a good expert because all of that stuff there is a lot of knowledge on that and and, and it's it's the I think a lot of that is best done talked about in the context of specific projects and programs and I'm always really happy to do that either either at Involve or in my own time as Suzanne said it all bleeds together um, so I'm, I'm a more of a practitioner than a theorist, so I also won't be talking about um, lots of the kind of theory behind deliberation. I'm going to talk about a couple of ways deliberation is being used in government and civic space right now. Um, and kind of with, with an eye to saying, I think this thing is bigger than all of us. I think it's bigger than all the ways it's being used um, and, and could be used a lot more. Um, so to, to do the kind of what is deliberation at the start, I'm not going to go into huge detail there, but I think it's always worth us remembering that, you know, d debate means literally to beat down and usually has the effect of entrenching people's opinions because none of us like being beaten into submission. Um, dialogue is often used as well as a, almost a substitute for or another way of talking about deliberation. And actually, they're very close things, but dialogue really means, you know, the word means going through or between and logos meaning speech or reason. So it's about sharing an inquiry. Um, and I always think of dialogue as being opening out. So widening the sphere of discovery, reframing our ideas. You don't have to decide anything in dialogue. You can just have a dialogue. And the benefit to you is that you're creating meaning between you and the other people and weaving the stories that have meaning to people. Um, and I think dialogue has its place sort of within deliberation. Deliberation is a kind of overlap or a, a wider, a wider space within which dialogue sits. Um, dialogue is super important on its own and within deliberation because life is really messy and noisy. Um, there's a talk at the Royal Institution next week, actually, I just saw it on Twitter about how biology and evolution may be much messier than we ever thought, that there's, there's just lots of redundancy and mess and competing narratives. And I think cultural life and political life and decision making is a lot like that as well. We need to shape stories from what we have and hear other people's stories. So you need dialogue because otherwise you just end up with the stories that just happen, the loudest or the, the boldest or the most powerful stories. And you need to make sure that you're hearing all the stories. So when you've got all those stories and you've opened out in that way, then you deliberate. And deliberate is delibre scales. It means to entirely weigh up to weigh up something entirely. And I love that idea that it's not just a kind of choice. I think often it's used um, in a research setting as a sort of substitute for, you know, a poll or something like that, where you say, well, what do people actually really want? Let's tell them more about more of the, of the information and they'll tell us the answer. And, and that can work, but it's usually a decision which understands a shared sense of the situation that everybody can live with. So it shows us what values we stand by and how we operationalize our principles. Um, because if we entirely weigh something up, we look at not just the decision itself, but how it will affect the things around it, how it will affect all the people it impacts and how it will affect, you know, future generations or the, 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 
the, the, our, our, our aims to become carbon neutral or you know how, how place and space operate within that so I like the idea that when you're thinking about doing a deliberation you're not just thinking about answering one policy question you can't silo it it always comes out into those broader those broader spaces so even if you're taking quite a big, brilliant question like um, Miriam at Engage Britain is taking on, you know, these questions around health and social care and, and justice and poverty and these things, they're still, they're always going to, when you deliberate, come out into people's lives and come out into the kind of the future and the past. So you have to be ready for that if you're doing deliberation and welcome that uncertainty um, and then find ways to shape that back into something that fits a decision making process. And that's why it's quite radical, because we're quite a society that still likes quick wins we like a media story that goes the prime minister has said this and that will happen or you know this policy will change blah 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 um you know by the next election we will have done these four things and and this is why deliberation is quite a radical thing because it makes us work to a slightly different timeline um i want to talk before i finish i want to talk briefly about citizens assemblies and then about um deliberations that don't have mini publics. So the citizens assemblies, I think are probably the most famous form of deliberation at the moment. And, and quite often you get almost like a backlash, which is where people are saying, because citizens assemblies are not perfect ways of deliberating, therefore we shouldn't do deliberation or therefore we should worry about deliberation. And I think they just, let's put them in their box. It's a big box, but let's be clear that they're a, a particular way of structuring deliberation into sessions between certain certain groups and they have some really good qualities about them and particularly the civic lottery is, is a really good quality that you you have you give many many thousands of people the chance to join and then you stratify the eventual group who are joining to really represent their wider community and and that doesn't mean that they are going to give you like the objective truth either that just means that you can be you can rely on the fact that they do in fact represent people they're better than not doing it if you like um, and, and, you know, any more than a poll that has 2000 people in can accurately represent the, the world. Uh, you know, that there are lots of ways you, you, you technically make that work to make sure that, 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 that your answer is as clear as possible. The way you design the question, the way you recruit, the way you administer your survey, all the rest of it. You know, that and people have trusted polling for a very long time in terms of its accuracy. And, and there are just as many questions around that as there might be around a citizens assembly. So I think we just have to take all of it with a bit of a pinch of salt, but also believe in it as, as, a, as a method that can that can get us somewhere in terms of understanding a deep sense of people's values and principles and what they want to happen. So the civic lottery is important. The link to authority is vital um, that you need to ask a question that is really a question that can be decided that needs to be decided on now by an, by an authority and that it needs to not shield people from the consequences of that decision so your question can't be you know wouldn't it be great if we all had really low taxes and free high quality health care because that that's you know that that that's not a <laughs> a question that's that's easily resolvable um and it needs to be something that then feeds into that decision process. And I would also say um, one of the things we learned from the Scottish Climate Assembly is that we had this eighth weekend. We had seven weekends of deliberation. They published a report where this eighth weekend where the, the participants and members went back and said, what have the government done with this? And do we like what they've said? And that was really useful. I think possibly the first of its kind in, in, in several ways. Um, and particularly helped the members kind of strengthen their own advocacy chops you know they were they were able to go and say well this is what we said this is what you did this is what we think about it this is what we think should happen next and I think those kind of continued wider cycles of of, of bringing deliberation into the wider the wider world and, and making it kind of implementable is really important um I've only got half a minute left so I will I will probably save some of my other comments about other methods for the questions um, I just want to make two final points. One is that um, Policy Lab have just included citizens assemblies as one of their innovative ways of experimental policy design. And I think this is a really welcome move to see it as a design tool rather than as a, a kind of way of getting at the truth. And I think that's a much better space for it to play in. And there's lots of implications there. Um, and then my, my final point, I think, is that deliberation where you, you don't have a representative group is super important as well and hopefully we can talk about more that more in the uh, in the um in the discussion there are some people who should have more say in some decisions than other people should and they really need to be deliberating um so whether that's you know patients or um people that live in a particular area or people who have been 
traditionally marginalized and have not had access to voice. I think there's you need to build a public engagement infrastructure that includes those people and includes deliberation. And I can talk about that for probably another hour, but I won't, I will stop. You can talk about it for another few minutes in a bit, but thank you okay. very much for that. I really enjoyed that, Sarah, and I really enjoyed your reflections, particularly on the kind of quiet radicalism that, that deliberation can bring, that it's, and I really love the way you expressed it, that it's not a method, it's it's a way of doing society, and also that in doing it, you have to welcome in uncertainty in terms of, of what people will bring to it themselves, the messiness of the data that you get from it, and how you have to push back on sort of traditional markers of success when it comes to research, that it's not something that can be done quickly, that you have to take your time over it. So thank you very much for that. Um, and now, Miriam, um, please, can you can you share your views? We'd love to hear from you. Sure, absolutely. So I want to start with a question. This is for everybody to, to think about. Do you trust politicians to make decisions in your best interest? Just going to leave you with that for a second. If you were thinking to yourself, oh, hell no, and that was even before you might have seen the Sue Gray report, then you're not alone, right? This is something that is now widespread across certainly Western society and certainly across the UK. So there's some polling that was done by Carnegie UK in January this year that shows that 41% of people in England say that democracy is not working, with the biggest threat being loss of trust. So in there, 76% of the public in England don't trust MPs to take decisions that will improve their lives. Now, for me, that really demonstrates that we have to think about how we can support our representative democracy to address that power imbalance that people are feeling between citizens and state. So we can come up with a new contract where people have the power in the system to be part of those messy, complicated, really difficult decisions that governments have to make all the time. And that's a way of getting involved, which is outside of our four or five year trip to the ballot box. So that's a massive opening statement it's really really easy to say that we should do this and much much harder to put into practice so in a sec I want to talk a little bit about what we're doing at Engage Britain to try and show that there might be another way a different way of kind of working our way through the system to give people a different position within that decision making power structure so Engage Britain was set up a couple of years ago and we're still relatively new we're a charity and really the reason we were set up was in recognition of the fact that the country is facing really massive challenges around cost of living, around the environment, around how do you access health and care. And our recognition that I think most people would probably feel is correct is that successive governments just aren't cracking it. They're not sorting out long-term sustainable solutions to these massive problems. Now there's loads of different reasons why that might be. So, Politics gets in the way, our electoral cycles kind of mitigate for kind of short term thinking. We've got a really adversarial two party system in the main. And there's really big structural issues. And those feel very, very difficult to shift. Like we're not going to change kind of how the structures work overnight. That's that's not a thing that anyone's really kind of pushing for or working towards in quite that way at the moment. But there's one more thing that we think that government and the way that policy making is done, which is actually means that it's not addressing these questions in a really sustainable way. And it means that policymaking so often fails to hit the mark. And that's because policymakers sitting in Westminster very, very rarely think outside of that Westminster bubble and think about really what are the impacts going to be and what are the perspectives of the people who are most impacted by their policy decisions. Now, I feel like I can say that because until uh, gosh, nearly two years ago, I was a policymaker, I was civil servant, I sat in government, I was head of community action um, in the Office for Civil Society. We were like a good bit of government, we were the nice guys, and yet all the decisions we made around our funding, around our policy decisions, we didn't ever really go talk to people in communities about what we were going to do. We just, we talked to some stakeholders, but we really didn't ever go and actually talk to people. And if we weren't doing it, I know that the rest of government really weren't doing it, really doing it either. So what Engage Britain was set up to do was to design and test a new model just to show by doing that you can actually create policy that puts people right at the heart of that process. One that builds policy from the grassroots up, starting from what really matters to people, bringing together people with different views and knowledge and experience to understand what issues are and develop solutions together that are actually going to kind of work in practice and crack some of those massive challenges. So a little bit about what we've actually done, a bit about our methodology. 
we started in January last year by just wanting to get to grips with what people's experience of health and care are now. So we held, as Suzanne referenced right up front, we held 101 community conversations, which um, involved about 700 people talking in small groups about their experiences of health and care, what they think works well now and what they think could be better. And those conversations included frontline NHS staff, people who draw on social care, people in communities from Surrey to Orkney, across the widest diversity of views and experiences that we could, we could gather in these groups. And I don't suppose it would be a shock to anybody that as a result of all of those conversations, we heard hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of stories about what is going wrong in health and social care. And obviously we recognise you can't tackle all of those all at once. So what we did in order to kind of work out where we need to start in tackling those issues is we set up our people's panel. So that was essentially a very pure form of deliberative democracy. It was a citizens assembly. We worked with the amazing team at Involve and the Democratic Society to design and facilitate that whole process. And we created this essentially our citizen assembly of 100 people selected at random after invitations were sent out to 30,000 people off the post office database. And then through a sortition process, selected to be broadly representative of populations of England, Scotland and Wales in terms of age, gender and ethnicity and geography, political view and disability. And their job was to decide which of all of these many, many issues that are out there should be tackled first. So what the participants did over four weekends was they shared their own experiences. They heard other people's perspectives via the stories that were shared in the community conversations. They decided what else they needed to know about and then listen to and ask questions of the experts that we brought in to plug those gaps. And they prioritised key issues and worked them through in a lot of detail on their last weekend. At the end of the process, they voted and they came up with their kind of top two um, priorities out of a list of seven. And those top two were recruitment, retention and training of social care staff and poor communication between the NHS and patients and the impact this has on waiting times and receiving care and people's mental health. So essentially the people's panel was really critical to provide that public's view of what's most important, but it's only one of the tools that we have in our toolbox. And as we moving on to the next phase of the work, which is about coming up with solutions to those two massive challenges that were set, we are using kind of different tools. And it's quite interesting to think about how we can use different tools to complement each other as we work through. So just taking one of those kind of pieces at a time, we are coming up with solutions to social care staffing. In order to do that, we're bringing people together who've got a stake in fixing that crisis. So what we've done is we've created the social care um, change group made up of 15 people and it'll meet for eight co-design workshops between May and September this year and their job is about developing really practical workable fundable plans for change so that group isn't made up of members of the public the really important thing was to bring the perspectives into the room that can really address this challenge so we're bringing in people who draw on social care we're We've got uh, frontline staff, we've got care providers who run care homes or provide care for people uh, within people's homes themselves, and people who commission and run care services within local authorities. So the point is that we, we need to bring those different perspectives together because there's no point in creating a solution that might improve career progression for care workers but can't be implemented by care providers or changes the way that local authorities commission services but doesn't actually fundamentally improve the care that people receive. So by using a co-design methodology, we're complementing the citizen assembly approach to come up with those ideas that can really work across all the different parts of the system. After that, our, our methodology kind of rolls on to thinking about, well, do these, would these ideas actually work? How can we test them with people with fresh eyes? So what we're going to be doing is testing through large scale polling and message testing with the general public at least in part, to understand how best to talk about kind of this sort of policy package that can get the widest cross section of the public behind it. Because for us, fundamentally, the most, even if we come up with the best ideas in the world, they're not going to get cross party political traction unless we can demonstrate that these potentially radical, potentially really expensive ideas actually have the backing of the public, which will translate into votes, which is how we're going to get politicians to kind of take them on board and kind of put those into practice. And that's the final part of this jigsaw, that in our, in our kind of series of steps to get through to the point where we've got these things implemented, the final part is about advocacy. So we're not 
the whole point of Engage Britain, it, we're not a think tank. We're not here to run an end to end policy making process just to write a final report to go, look, it can be done and that will sit on the shelf somewhere. It's absolutely about putting these people powered policies into practice, getting them picked up by political parties across the spectrum, put into manifestos and implemented. So alongside all the work that we're doing around engaging people and involving them in this process, which is fundamental to the whole thing, we're also building relationships across the political spectrum in England and Scotland and Wales to, at the moment, just prepare the landing zone for the policies. So talking to government ministers and the shadow labour and um, health and social care team, senior officials from the Department of Health and Social Care and the NHS. And we're taking the outputs of the co-design workshops to the party political conferences this year in September and October. So basically for us, the most important thing is that all of this is to show not only in theory that you can run an end-to-end -end policy making process, but that you can work it all through. And then over the longest term and our time horizon is several years hence that we will hopefully get these ideas taken up brought into the political debate, become part of the political conversation, implemented and actually start to change people's lives. So I'm going to wrap up there because I possibly have talked for a bit longer than I was supposed to have done, sorry. Um, just to say we're, we're still very much in the foothills of this work. It's It feels like we're very, very much kind of at the beginning of the journey. This is the first project that Engage Britain has worked on. We haven't seen it through all the way to the end. We don't know what impact it's going to have yet. But we're starting and we're testing deliberative and design methods to demonstrate that if you do that and you can put people at the heart, we want to show that it can be done and it can lead to real change for people, both in terms of how for this particular project they access health and care, but more fundamentally how they can engage really meaningfully in our democracy. Thank you. Thank you so much, Miriam. That was a, such a really interesting reflection on on the work that you've been doing and a, a really inspiring vision as well for for how things can change and, and the scale of it too is so impressive the idea of 101 community conversations involving over 700 people is just the the ambition is is there and it's it's so exciting to hear about the progress that you're making um so just before we turn to our audience and i know that there's a question in the chat which i'm i'm going to come back to shortly um i just want to use and abuse our privileges as chair if that's all right and and ask a few questions ourselves and firstly one to both of you um and you've touched on this but but really kind of interested in personal motivation here but why is deliberation such an important approach for you why is why is this a space that you want to work in and want to work in now sarah you can come in first Can i go first i mean i said i said a bit of this in, in, in yeah. what i was saying earlier but i think you know the the, the more we do with people I mean it's, it's answering miriam's question as well do people really trust politicians to make decisions in their own best interest and i think maybe we don't but also we don't really have any have the ideas as to what what would work instead and i think deliberation can help us see see our way to just having different kind of flexing different muscles when we think about making a decision but at the moment there are things in like from some sort of Root, root to tip in the whole system of decision making where you know this is how you plan something this is how you make a decision here's who you talk to here's what you do and I think there are some other chunks of human experience that just don't get included and, and that's why you end up with you know 72 percent of people saying the system needs a great deal of improvement or you know 63 percent of people saying Britain's system of government is rigged in favor of rich and powerful people and, and I just don't want to live in a world where we think that I want I want to be in a place where where we have a sense of trust and transparency, but you can't do that without actually rebuilding the institutions. Um, but yeah, the challenge is then how do you how do you persuade people that it's in all of our best interests? And and it is, I suppose. My my final point on why I want to do it is because I think genuinely, if we don't, we're going to end up with such an inequitable society that all of the problems like climate change and challenges of digital life and all those sort of things are going to kind of bite us very hard and even if we're at the top of the heap at the moment in terms of power and voice we, we won't stay there so it's sort of in all of our interests really that's my altruistic motivation my personal motivation is because it's really interesting hearing people talk about stuff it's more interesting than being at one remove that's great thank you and, and Miriam I was wondering if you could if you could reflect on it as well. You talked about being, you know, in the good guys of government, which and then and then sort of moving over um, 
you know where you really engage with people as well so i was wondering if you could if you could just give us a bit more insight into why deliberation is such an important approach for you and why it's a why it's a space you want to be working in right now if we don't work to improve how people can engage with democracy if we don't find these other methods and channels and ways of giving people a voice and being part of these things that really impact on their daily lives well the alternative is just much 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 worse i i i'm <laughs> talking about this before I'm, I'm essentially a very optimistic person but sometimes i just look at the way it is very easy to see a way that this country could go any country could go which kind of heads you down an authoritarian kind of an authoritarian route that feels like we've got some time to pull us back from a brink and to me the only way we're going to do that is if we just find these find these routes and channels to give people a different active voice in our democracy and in the decisions that affect them and the thing is we know that people want to be part of it like the, we've done all manner of polling from which one it was i think it's the community life survey that um that kind of demonstrates like people really want to be involved they really think it's important but they don't know how they don't have the chance they don't have the opportunities and often feel like well there's no point in me kind of filling in that next consultation survey from government or from my local authority because it's not going to make any difference anyway the ambition and the will is there. We just have to find kind of the routes and the channels by which we can get people engaged. And then for me personally, um, I worked in government for five years and that was, let's go with interesting, really, really interesting to see how that sort of democracy kind of works close up. But it also made me realise it's fairly dysfunctional. And I'm very happy to step outside of that particular environment and see what can be done from the outside. Because I think there's the, the push from civil society and from um, sort of the charitable sector and from people is the way that the change is going to come, trying to influence kind of that system that holds the power at the moment, but doing it from outside the system felt like a more fruitful place to be. That's a good reflection. Thank you. And, and Sarah, I just want to pick up on something as well. I mean, you, you talked really clearly about the kind of messiness of, of deliberation, that it kind of bleeds, you know, whatever the policy question is, it bleeds into other issues as well. But but I, I just want you to reflect on some of the pressing policy problems that we are facing in the UK. And, you know, Miriam's working on a few of them right now, and, and you are kind of spoiled for choice as to which, which policy problem. I can't problem think of anything that we need to sort of <laughs> You might want to go for, but, but where do you think it, it should be used that it hasn't been to date? Um, I think uh, there, there's two sides to it, and it actually starts to answer some of the questions people are asking in the Q&A box mm -hmm. as well about the, the how do we get appetite for it among decision makers as well? How do we make people feel that it's needed? Um, and I think one of the one of the ways is the big way we say there are huge, big, intractable problems that we face and that you as a politician, for example, face and you can't you can't get a mandate to do what you want to do or you you have values driven decisions where there's a hugely polarized set of views or you're scared to take action because you know there'll be a huge backlash and I think there, there's a whole set of issues around that which I think as a sec, as a deliberative sector if you like we've not been very good at going in quite bolshily to politicians and saying give us your biggest problem you know some people do new democracy in Australia do that very well and, and I've just started a brilliant campaign called change politics which I, I really recommend everyone look at because th there's a two paragraphs on their website makes the case for deliberation and citizens assemblies better than a lot of you know the work that's been done elsewhere um so there's that kind of tell the big story you know we we will sort you know we immigration is a massive hot mess in the media and in the world and in people's opinions and in how people feel able to talk about it here are some ways that we can untangle that take the heat out make it something that you can think of ways forward so that's one of the big story the other one is the little story the bottom-up story so this is about creating as i said this infrastructure of public engagement in very very local spaces around things that people can have a real say on so you know your your street needs to generate electricity in a cheaper way so that your bills are less high therefore there are lots of things where business and government and local government and local people can be kind of brought in and these techniques used as a way of kind of making change and and growing growing impacts locally and then um you know as i think someone has said in the, in the questions there are some great examples of impact but we need more of them and then more kind of joining up of those little globules so communities of practice 
lo- around different people locally who are trying to achieve different things, which, you know, to do a quick plug for something Involve is doing, we have um, uh, a, a fantastic um, grant to run local climate engagement projects. So that's, so I, I don't know if there's any of our um, local councils or local authorities on, on the call today who are taking part in that. Um, but that's that's to say, you know, here, you want to, ch- to, to, to think about how you engage your, your local community on climate. There's loads of different ways you can do it. There's lots of different methods you can use and there's some best practice that can be shared so just creating that sort of head of steam around best practice and and people who feel they may be the only person that sort of gets it in their immediate um working environment and joining them up with other people who get it and who find ways to argue it and and make the case for it um i think that can help us solve those climate problems locally or really any other issues thank you now miriam i don't know if you've got any any reflections on that about about where it could be used let's say Let's say you've managed to resolve the issues in in social care, and and then you you've you've sorted out inequality. Where where next? Where which kind of which kind of place would you take deliberation after that? You're on mute. Sorry. Um, yeah, no, it's really interesting. So obviously, the first challenge we're taking on is around health and care because when we ask people what's the number one fit challenge facing the country, they said health and care. It's like well, that's what we're led by. Then we'll start there. But in a way, I've got a slightly easier job that. Actually, most people agree that health and care is a good, it's a good thing. We want more health, we want more care. It's all, you know, now we just have to work out how to get there. So there's not actually much um, um, kind of disagreement on on kind of on the principle of should people have more access to health care? Well, yes, they should. Funnily enough, I was going to pick on something that Sarah said that actually a topic like immigration that's where it gets really interesting because there's definitely a whole series of arguments that go more immigration, good thing, more immigration, bad thing. Like there, there, you don't have that across the piece um, kind of consensus around, is this a good, is this bad? How are we going to tackle it? And so to use kind of a a series of methodologies and absolutely put into liberation at the heart, which goes, okay, so how do you build bridges? How do you kind of take the divides that exist within society confront them head on and go okay but then where can we find the nodes that actually bring people together that to me is where it's going to get really interesting where deliberation is the only way we're going to do that because just putting people head to head exactly like Sarah said which is about kind of is this debate which kind of pits people against each other at opposing sides it's not going to get us very far clearly it doesn't work we have massively toxic discourse on it so how are we going to it's not about hitting the lowest common denominator and it's not always finding kind of the easy kind of the easy answers that everyone can get behind but it's about looking at trade-offs and it is about being really honest and open about where the impacts lie and how it matters to different people and not excluding anybody from that debate so yes if you're going to do a take a difficult topic I'd say immigration would be I mean, guess you'd probably want to go it would be incredible what a what a what a, what a program of work that would be. Um, I just want to, I'm conscious in the last sort of 10 minutes, I just want to bring in some questions from the audience. And there's a couple of themes that are emerging um, that I want to touch on. One is one is around impact. So Helen McLaughlin has mentioned this, but also, also Rima Patel from Ipsos as well, um, formerly Ada Lovelace and RSA. And how can we, how can we make sure that, that this work does have impact? Um, how can we make sure there is? And is there a growing body of evidence around the impact that deliberative process do have on, on high level decision making? So I was wondering if we could turn to that first. Sarah, have you got some reflections? Yeah, and I actually popped something into one of the comments, um, just making a link back to the OECD's great work on on. on codifying those those impacts but I think there is there is a long way to go because quite often the impacts are just looked at in terms of the impacts on the participants in the process rather than the wider policy impacts and it may be because some of the roots of these processes are in research where people tend to be a little bit scared of kind of getting their hands dirty in the in the policy space which is why um, people like Miriam and the Engage Britain project is so is so important um I think I, I think yeah, if I if I knew how to completely go in and get it get it nailed and make everyone take it take it seriously and do it, then I think involved would be a um, a lot busier even than we even than we are. Um, I think it, I think it's it's got to be about making the advocacy part of it core to the design in the first place. So rather than just saying, you know, here's a really interesting thing we could do in a really interesting way, we could get people to talk about it, building in that kind of legitimacy and and authority and 
finding the question that people do feel that they can they can allow the public allow allow the public in a sense to to have a view on and to change the outcome of and and helping to helping the people that are making decisions to understand that the decision will be better and stronger and more you know some of the arguments that seem to be work, working well are making it more future proof so you're not going to then have a huge reputation list you don't have to do a u-turn when you do a decision that that maybe doesn't really work or policy that actually does work on the ground because you haven't forgotten a group of people who are service users or who have a stake in your policy who, whose voices haven't been heard or that you haven't really taken into account um, it's those sort of there are some very sort of practical arguments I think about uh, about how you how you use it and take it on board and I think the more there is of that the more there will be of institutions saying okay we can get behind this we, we will take these three or four examples in this space and we will say we can get behind it across spaces so a, a, a final thought on that is to to look at the issues where they cross functions so look at institutions and say well you know climate change is going to affect a local a local authority in terms of you know planning environment transport waste management uh, buildings procurement everything so all of the spheres of influence of a local authority are impacted by this one issue and that's where you can then come in and 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 talk to people and help people talk to their own colleagues about how the public can be involved you know or, or, or um yeah I'll, I'll, I'll stop there and let others speak but uh, I think those are some of the ways that you can kind of create impact and, and demonstrate impact. Thank you. And, and Miriam, I don't know if you've got any reflections on, on how we can make sure that this kind of deliberative work does have impact, how we can increase uptake, things like that. Right. So if you're going to, the most important thing is that when any deliberative process kind of works its way through and comes out with its solutions or recommendations or decisions or whatever it is that those are actually taken up and you know that whichever organization government department business whatever it is that's commissioned that process actually acts on the recommendations if not it's actually personally i would say it is worse than not doing it at all not doing not asking the question in the first place if you're not going to listen to the answer it's more disheartening and more disempowering to kind of run through that process where people can really engage and really believing it and really feel like and they make a difference and then find that actually the local authority or government that's commissioned this thing is not going to act on it better never to have asked the question in the first place but I have to say there's now hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of examples of kind of deliberative processes happening across the world and some incredible places where they've institutionalized kind of built in those deliberative processes into their decision making process at local or national government level and that's really really exciting it still feels a bit early to say whether they're actually influencing decisions and we could be able to point to like a body a growing body of evidence that goes now you see here where East Belgium implemented this process and this has now led to this decision and people are now seeing this result is actually making change on the ground and they are happier because it's going to take some time, I think, for those to trickle through the system. But we're, we're starting to see them, we're starting to get them. And I think that's the point at which you can go to the politicians who are perhaps less brave about trying kind of a new and innovative kind of still feels like quite an innovative new tool to go. It's not that scary. People are really sensible. Actually, you think that kind of the great masses are like, it's quite easy to think that people are just kind of full of toxic hatred as what this what spews out of Twitter. Actually, get them in the room, get them talking to each other, get them to hear different perspectives. And actually you can allay all of that toxicity and just enable people to think, think kind of past that to actually what's best for the common good. And the more examples that we've got, the more examples that we've, we can show that that is actually made a policy decision better as a result. I think I, what I'd like to say is that we'll actually kind of see like a domino effect of kind of a multiplier effect rather kind of, of, of this kind of like growing and spreading across kind of all political decision making because actually I think it's the only way forward. Thank you both. Um, I'm not sure in my, I've been in and out on this call, so I really apologize for that. So I wondered if we'd had anything on how to do it well online. Um, <laughs> Maybe that's for another day. <laughs> I could pick up some tips, um, but that's not my next question to you both. Um, we've had some questions about kind of scaling up. So obviously one of the things which online offers us and some, um, some of the lessons perhaps we've learned over the pandemic um, is about involving great numbers of people in forms of deliberation, both on and offline. Um, and so um, including from uh, Michelle Ipsos, who's also asked this question. So do either of you have any reflections on how can we scale up deliberations? Um, and how can we do so without compromising quality? Which I know is a tough question, but I'd be interested in any reflections you both have. 
and this but no go Mary go on. I mean okay. I think there's really really interesting stuff coming out of um, Stanford University yeah. um, and their deliberative polling and kind of evolving um, using sort of AI moderators to be able to bring 1,000, 2,000 people into an online space to kind of have those kind of moderated discussions. I think that's incredibly exciting. That, but that still isn't kind of population wide. It's still yeah. a number that's only say one order of magnitude greater than what we're doing over here. How can you do something at much greater scale? I mean, we're looking at Engage Britain about how do you how do you use kind of online platforms to kind of draw in ideas at scale. It's less about the deliberative space and more about, can we at least create a platform that allows people to put in ideas and comment on them? So it isn't as kind of the pure form, like really kind of face-to-face -face in a small group, hearing different perspectives, but you know, there's there's kind of a version that can work online. And we've tried that. We've we tried that on our health and care work. We create a platform using your ideas software, which has been really, really great. And we've got quite a lot of ideas we were hoping for thousands we got 50 it's not it, you know we haven't quite kind of cracked it yet like how do you get in kind of open up this space to anybody who's got a stake in the journey kind of like putting in their ideas interestingly what we did find is that when we asked the same questions on social media we got 800 responses some of the quality mm -hmm. isn't as um detailed and nuanced as as it is on the on the platform which kind of has a little bit more space for people to reflect and kind of put in their ideas but people engaged and actually put in some inc really incredible stuff that will now feed into our rest of our process into the social care change group so i think there's it feels still like really early days in how you kind of scale this up but to be honest where i'd like to be is the point at which we you know either yourself or somebody you know has been actively part of a citizens assembly or a process that it becomes so mainstream and so common that's like it's like jury service everyone's either done it or knows somebody who's doing it or to be fair has tried to get out of it but then does it and it's quite interesting i put what i really want is to get to the point of where your civic duty includes being part of local decision making it's not every time it's not you all the time it's not always the people who've got their hands up and are like super keen it's like i want to do it like i would be doing that because i love this stuff but it becomes something that is just it's just a given that you give your time to be part of a decision which will improve life for your community, your country, kind of your network. One day. Yeah, there's, so much, there's, so much to, there's so much to unpack, isn't there? Because because as well, there's um, that 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 putting up your hand to be part of local decision making is is super important. But we also need the infrastructure that allows the people who can't put their hands up to be part of that because actually you know there's a lot of power and privilege in having the time and space to put your hand up to be part of it and and actually there's there's the, there's a number of ways that we, that we need to make sure we scaffold people people's involvement and that, that's a whole other seminar that you may probably come on to in your in your seminar series um around how to how to make sure that everyone gets involved um but but there's and, that, and that's one of the issues around the, the at scale model as well because at scale quite often means you know just using digital platforms and there are still lots of challenges with that you know for every cool person replying to Miriam's um, tweets about great new ideas for policy there's somebody's mum crying in a car park because they don't they don't have a smartphone that they can download their app onto to pay for their parking which was a, a story going around Twitter yesterday if anyone saw it so so that we can't just sort of put our faith in that and that that relates to maybe one of the questions around is this technical is this all just technocrats running government and policy and uh, and citizens assemblies and everything is is this a kind of a, a set of theories and thinking that applies to certain sorts of people um so i think there's i think we have to do we have to build deliberation at scale in you realizing that it's always going to be a patchwork and a patchwork that with different methods and approaches suited to different types of people at different times and that's the vision i'd probably add to miriam's vision of a society where everyone's heard of it and they want to be part of it by but by saying everyone should have heard of it and want to be part of something but the thing that they're part of might be different depending on who they are I think the thing we need to do is kind of tell the story that they're all part of a of a process I'm, sh I'm sure deliberation isn't the kind of the sexiest thing to call it and I'm struggling with another you know there's probably a word that someone will come up with soon about you know what is this thing that we're adding to the ecosystem of decision making that that, that we want to have as standard um, that that operates in lots of different settings and can be done on line can be done in a you know in, in a clever um, digitalized way to involve masses of people and AI moderators but can also be done by two people and a dog in a church hall you know it's the same thing um, so I think I think that's that, that there's something about strengthening it that way 
Thank you. Um, very conscious of time, but also very conscious of a number of really fascinating um, questions in the chat. So we're just going to pull out another couple, and then before we before we draw things to a close, but there's there's a couple of which which touch on appetite in government. So Zoe Wilkins has asked whether there's appetite in government for more participation and inclusion of deliberative processes, and then Pancho Lewis has also asked, um, you know, whether whether you think there's, there's, the government is open to embracing ways of involving citizens more directly, but perhaps even more than just running the odd citizens assembly, maybe thinking about institutionalization. So something that I know the OECD and Claudia Chalitz has written a lot about, um, but I was just wondering Miriam, perhaps whether you've got any reflections on that, whether you think there is that appetite there. Um, I'd say my experience of being in government um, having left a couple of years ago now, but didn't really feel like there was a massive appetite for involving people in decision making, like through citizens assemblies. Having said that, obviously, I did run the innovation and democracy program that did test citizens assemblies at local authority level, and that kind of absolutely government funded first government program that tested it. But that felt like very much an uphill battle to get there. Um, I think what we're finding now is that I'm not sure that we could say that there's an appetite there for the methodology. I don't think that's what politicians are interested in. Why would they be? They're very busy. They've got these massive things they have to tackle. Some people are interested in methods and how you get there, but the majority of the people that we're speaking to is like, yeah, but are you going to get us a good answer? Like, a, a, And actually, I mean, good in its broadest sense, like actually an answer that's going to improve things that we can implement, that we can afford, that people will get behind. And I think the way that we're going to kind of build up that appetite is by saying exactly like New Democracy Foundation says that the Sarah can mention before, it's like, what's your hardest problem? We can help you get your answer. This is where it's been done. This is where we can show that, you know, this social care crisis that we've been like battling for decades. Okay, here's an answer. It's actually going to work. And that's when people get interested and go, all right, we can actually, you know, there's a model there that might actually work. Thank you. And Sarah, I wonder if you've had any reflection on whether there's appetite for this and, and how we maybe how we build it as well, how we can create demand. Yeah, I, I agree with Miriam that it's not about going and saying, look at this amazing method and, and, and even things like the sort of can we can we use online tools or scale it up is that that's all, if somebody is not really believing that, you, that, that the public ought to be brought in in that way, that's not that's not going to make the case. Um, so we're doing quite a lot of work involved. We've got a relatively new advocacy and comms function, which is really exciting. And, and so this year we've been doing a lot of kind of building the case work and talking to politicians and talking to other people about what is it, what are the arguments that, that really work? And they're, they're sit there and, and also there's been some kind of messaging work done around with, with the public as well, just to see what, what kind of works. I think a lot of it that there is a political side to it because I, I you know there, there, there are things that civil servants will like and will want to to put in and they may be more interested in some of the methods and some of those kind of nature of the way the evidence is gathered but there's also a kind of political angle on it which is if you say there, there are words you can say that go down well with the left and go down well with the right and you have to make sure that you're you're speaking to everybody because not everyone thinks the same about the way we should about about our about equity about rights about freedoms about lots of these kind of concepts that we that that, that people sort of take for granted in different ways and a lot of the, the the discussion about why you should involve the public often comes back to quickly referencing ideas that you sort of assume others share and I think we have to be more careful that we don't assume everyone thinks the same and that everyone wants the same kind of kind of society but that actually there's something in, there is something in it for everyone if you bring deliberation in it does help everyone um what, what, whatever kind of stance you take um that I think there's also something really important in saying it's not about replacing decision making, but it's about um, enhancing it and, and, and working with people who, who are charged to make those decisions. And um, I mean, in terms of the, the just the it's the same question we've been answering throughout, isn't it? How do you how do you just build build appetite? I think you just have to show spaces where there are challenges and problems and and show that it doesn't have to be hugely expensive. And that as I think someone has said in the chat that not doing it might be more expensive that not building it in might be more costly. Also, that it doesn't have to take, you know, 12 months and involve millions and millions of people and millions of pounds. There are ways of being deliberative and agile as well that, that are equally valid. Developing that language that speaks to both sides is, is so important. I'm just going to hand over to, to Kerry to see if she uh, is there to, to wrap up, perhaps. 
on the time and, and to respect the fact that you all joined us in your lunch break and I'm sure you have things to go on to now. I just wanted to, we've had some great questions to so say thank you so much for, for pitching in and giving our panellists something to think about and us. Um, before I give my final thanks uh, to both you for joining and to, Mir to Miriam and Sarah for their contributions, I just wanted to ask Miriam and Sarah one last thing. I think we might ask everyone who joins, uh, joins us for this. Um, one sentence, what do you think is next for deliberative research? So I know that's a tricky one, but just what comes to mind? Uh, Miriam and Sarah, who wants to go first? Miriam looks like she's ready. <laughs> also, go go Mottling my thoughts. Um, yeah. What do I think is next or what do I want to be next? Well, it's your answer, so you can say whichever you please. What I want, what I want to... What I want to be next is for this to be normalised. Yeah. It's yeah. Just to be how we do things. This is just how it works. It is so normal. It's so part of everyday life that we are, we have opportunities to be kind of those active, mobilised citizens, like kind of taking our place in, in kind of the decisions that affect us. And that is absolutely where kind of government wouldn't even think about making a decision that hasn't done, yeah. hasn't involved and involved talking to people in that decision making process. Thank you, Miriam. Uh, Sarah? Yeah, I'll, I'll have what she's having. Um, yeah. <laughs> me too. <laughs> um, I, yeah, I think normalised is really is, is, is an important word. Um, I think there's something as well about a building capacity of people that have to do it because it, it's easy for me or someone like me to sit out outside the system and say this is what everybody should be doing but I, I, what I think will be next is that we'll see a huge range of different sorts of networks and capacity building projects and peer learning and action learning among the people who are commissioning and funding this kind of work and working in government and working at the sharp end of that how do you deal with your you know the, the, the demands on your time and your budget and how do you actually make it happen and how do you deal with your contractor who's kind of snootily coming in and saying oh I'm afraid you need more people than that for it to be you know methodologically valid while at the same time someone internally is saying can you get us results back in two weeks and I think I think that I think the, the scaffolding of that group of people will be critical to making it a more normalized thing. Brilliant. Well, thank you. They're two definitely inspirational things to take into the afternoon. Um, so I want to thank you uh, very much for those who have joined uh, the session today for uh, the conversation with Sarah and Miriam. And of course, thank you to Sarah and Miriam for sharing their expertise and their experience so generously with us. Um, as for next steps, there's just two things to look out for. Uh, the first is that we, being Suzanne and I, will be writing up our reflections on today's conversation and, and taking on board as well some of the questions that have come through that we might not have had time to um, answer in the session. Um, and we're going to share those with you and, and sort of make them public. And we look forward to hearing any thoughts that you have in response, both on today, but also for future seminar slots. And the second um, is that obviously this is the first um, in, in a, an ongoing Deliberate series. Uh, the next um, seminar will be in about six weeks. So all I want you to do is just kind of watch this space um, for both the date and for the speakers that will be joining us. Um, and we really hope that if you enjoy today, you'll consider joining us then as well. Uh, so I just want to say thank you for me and I'm sure Suzanne will too. Thank you so much. Pleasure to have you all here. And thank you to Sarah and Miriam for your time. We wish you all a good afternoon and we hope to see you again soon. Thank you.